and a good Friday afternoon to everybody who has either called in or logged on to our Psalm series webinar number three, where we are profiling impactful relationships inside of the dental sleep medicine practice. Um, three of our six webinars feature dentists with their prescribing physicians, and that's exactly what we have here today with Dr. John Viviano, who practices up there in the great white north of Canada, along with uh, Dr. Howard Awad and his son slash partner, Michael Awad, uh, sleep dentist up there that work closely uh, with, uh, with Dr. Viviano. Welcome, guys. How are we today? Good. How are you? Thanks. Thanks. We're, we're fine. I, as I've started off the first couple of webinars that we've done, I've kind of asked, you know, we're living in crazy times, right, with, with COVID-19 and all, and, and I know that we have a lot of people logged on and dialed in from the U.S., um, not really knowing what's going on up there in Canada, and you've got a lot of colleagues dialed in here as well. Why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, uh, what's currently going on up there and, and how, how everybody's dealing with COVID-19? John, I'll maybe let you take it away from the from the dental aspect to start. Okay, well, we're in Ontario, and uh, from the dental aspect, we're still on shutdown. And as we were discussing pre-broadcast uh, starting here, it probably won't be till the end of June that uh, they allow us to go back to the office. Our college is busy reviewing what's going on and writing up our protocols and what's expected of us. And um, they're even cautioning us about going overboard on making, uh, say, material changes in our practice because it might be more than what's needed. So they're, they're, they're really trying to use evidence-based approach to what they're expecting of us and managing our patients, but we're still on lockdown aside from very small number of emergency like categories that are, and dental sleep medicine doesn't fall into that cat, those categories. And um, that's, that's our status as dentistry right now. We're still all on break. Yeah. What so, about, yeah. What about you guys? So from the uh, from the sleep medicine aspect, I mean, you know, we uh, we've been following best guidance from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, who have been putting out uh, COVID mitigation strategies for sleep specialists, and so we were able to really quickly shift towards a telemedicine platform, uh, you know, which has been extremely helpful in allowing us to continue seeing and caring for patients. Uh, on the side of, you know, performing uh, sleep studies, you know, obviously there's a period there that, uh, you know, those had ceased completely and very slowly starting to look at, you know, resuming those types of emergency or, you know, required studies for uh, patients with severe symptoms or with severe sleep apnea, suspected severe sleep apnea. And so those are very slowly starting to resume, you know, following new protocols, uh, social distancing and high level disinfection. Uh, and, uh, you know, just very slowly starting to to uh, look at how we can uh, uh, safely provide this necessary care to our patients in Ontario. One one point of note is that in Ontario, which is going to differ for, uh, you know, for some of our viewers from the U.S., where uh, I actually practice between both the U.S. and Canada. So uh, just to give that, that little bit of, uh, you know, light on, on the differences here. Uh, in a lot of, you know, tertiary academic centers, in particular in the U.S., we see primarily home sleep testing happening, which is, uh, frankly, a lot more conducive to our current situation and adhering to social distancing protocols and what have you. Uh, but in Ontario, only uh, in-lab sleep studies are really funded, uh, you know, provincially speaking. So the majority of sleep studies that occur are uh, happening in an in-lab setting, or actually, I would say 98%, really. Uh, there are there is a, you know some providers that provide home sleep testing, uh, but primarily we're still in in the in lab setting, and so that really changes the dynamic as far as you know what we're doing and how we're able to provide care at the moment. Yeah. Hmm. Have, have um, you been doing the in lab sleep testing at this time through this period? We not through the entire period. We've just recently started to resume, like I said, you know, limited studies for those patients that are that are uh, most at risk. And so that's uh, you know that's a mixed bag. There are some sleep labs that are still uh, in a period of transition, trying to you know figure out how to adapt to this. Uh, we're fortunate in that we had a pretty dedicated telemedicine platform set up prior to all of uh, this happening. And so you know we're used to having our staff work from home. We're used to 
uh, having some of our, you know, telemedicine consults carried out and uh, providing care in, in that manner. So uh, we were fortunate to be able to at least provide care for those emergency patients where needed. Have you considered adding um, or offering uh, HSTs, realizing that, of course, the patient's paying out of their pocket because yeah. of lack of reimbursement? Uh, do you ever do that, or have you considered doing that, or are you even allowed to do that? That's yeah, it, it's a great question. We're in such a different landscape in Ontario than, than even other provinces and also uh, versus the United States as well. Um, you know, we, we do have the capability and we do offer home testing. We have, uh, you know, for those familiar with the various testing systems, we use a NOx system, uh, which has capability to transition between both. I think you actually, John, you use uh, a NOx system. Is that right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So you have the, the, the capability to transition from a full level one in-lab study to, you know, a, a portable home sleep test. The, the, the issue becomes, you know, there's, there's a fair bit of reluctance for patients who are, are covered under... Uh, you know, provincial uh, funding to to kind of pay for sleep studies out of pocket. So it's something that uh, that you know it's it's infrequent, I would say, but we do offer it. Guys, let's get into a little bit of a discussion about your professional dynamic. Um, uh, you know, exceptional dental medical relationships as it relates to referrals, bi-directional referrals going back and forth is really um, so critically important when it comes to taking the best care of patients. Tell us a little bit about how you guys started working together, where it all started and why. I, I uh, have known uh, John and I uh, have worked with him for uh, most probably over 25 years. He is one of the uh, pioneers and leaders in uh, dental sleep medicine and he's very committed very de dedicated to his patient and to his work and also does an awful lot of work in the community and to his colleagues and to students which i've always been uh, very impressed with so uh, we have had a long-term relationship very mutually respective and positive relationship and what have you our issue or dilemma in, in, in Ontario as well uh, is that the dentist cannot refer patient for a sleep study, although they see a very large number of patients with uh, sleep issues or OSA needing to be assessed uh, at, at the clinic. So um, uh, he has to recommend to the patient to go back to the family physician. The family physician has to refer the patient to us and then we can only assume the care of the patient at that point in time. Once that step took place, then we work cooperatively because obviously anybody who is a good candidate for John to look after or what have you, uh, following uh, sleep study evaluation and the result, we share it with him. And then obviously if you know the patient elects to go with an oral device, uh, John will take it from there, and we work cooperatively down the road in terms of uh, post-airway uh, orthotic reassessment, addressing any other issues, and so on and so forth. So that is really like the model that we we function under. We are limited because it will be much more easier if we are able to refer people back and forth and to work directly without that mid link which unfortunately end up in a large number of patients not being seen. What about system, you, John? When did it all start? Well, the, 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 just to further, thank you, Dr. Watt, the, the, the further those comments, the, the system is really not set up to work efficiently, unfortunately, and, and the patient suffers as a result. And there's a lot of systems out there that are broken, not just in Ontario. This is just, you know, one example of what we have to deal with. Um, I, I think that they, they, they like to, uh, OHIP is trying to control um, you know, the referrals that go to the sleep specialist and make sure they're validated and so forth. But in doing so, they make it more cumbersome and actually more costly because now they have an extra appointment where the patient has to go to the physician to get referred to. And then sometimes it doesn't happen and doesn't, there's no follow through and so forth. And, and so it's problematic at best. Now, um, uh, how about me? Uh, basically, I, I, like, I like working with physicians that, uh, you know, uh, 
I'm gonna say yeah, this like like following guidelines and and following that. And so when somebody has got a high integrity office, then those are the people that I'm gonna associate myself with, um, and 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 working together with the patients. And and um, uh, I remember Dr. Awad, and I'm not sure another name from the past. He's retired now, but Dr. Awad will remember him. Dr. Te anyway, those were the two first physicians that I worked with back in. Uh, 96, 97, whatever, and um, and I remember the first time I spoke to them, I was so nervous because I was talking to a specialist, a medical specialist, and I'm a dentist. I mean, I, you know how far down that is on the totem pole, right? So, you know, it's taken 25 years, but now I can actually call him by his first name and feel totally comfortable speaking to him, but, but I remember that, uh, and, and the reason I share that is that those dentists out there that uh, are starting to get involved in oral appliance therapy and the first time they're going to be speaking with a medical specialist, um, they're probably going to be quite nervous and just don't be. You know, you, you have your expertise that you bring to the table. Just, you know, do good work, follow the guidelines, follow the protocols, and the physician will appreciate that and respect you for that and work with you if you do that. So there's no reason to be nervous. You, you have what you bring to the table and they appreciate that. So that's, that's the reason I mentioned that. Yeah, really to, to even further that, uh, you know, John, and, and you speak so with, with such humility as, a, as really a, a leader in the field in, uh, in our area and beyond that, but, uh, you know, I think one of the things I've observed that, you know, that the dental community has really understood so well is really the impact of facial skeletal structure uh, on sleep disordered breathing. And this is something that, you know, has been passed down onto me from one of my, you know, surgical dental mentors. He's an oral maxillofacial surgeon, Stanley Liu, who was my mentor at Stanford. Um, and really just, just understanding, you know, what the impact is of, of craniofacial growth and development, that maxillary and mandibular structure. And I think that that's something that, frankly, you know, as a, as a physician community, my colleagues and, and I, you know, we can do a lot better uh, to understand, but that's something that really the dental community has grasped so well in sleep disordered breathing. And that really is where the, the power in that relationship lies, because they're really the first people to evaluate this. They're the they're the ones that are looking at, you know, the, the maxillary structure. They're looking at, you know, the width of the jaw. They're looking at the protrusion of the jaw. They're looking at the bite. And, uh, you know, I think uh, until you really understand that component and how much of an impact it has on ultimately the development of sleep disordered breathing, you're probably missing a big part of the picture. So a lot of credit goes to our dental colleagues and especially people like John who are, you know, pioneering forward to really uh, to really understand this relationship and and to to work with uh, with people like us uh, to really establish this in the field. Right, yeah. Dr. Howard, I got a question for you. You've been around sure. a long time, and I'm just wondering, at what point for you did did the did the light bulb go off where you uh, kind of came to the realization that oral appliance therapy is is uh is an efficacious uh highly compliant therapy when when did you finally kind of come around on oral appliance therapy i would say within maybe a couple of years uh, uh from working with john uh, which would be most probably by uh, 1998 uh, there were enough patients by then that were referred and have had an, um, an oral uh, device and were using it at home and they came back for the evaluation and they uh, were well controlled and doing well. They were reasonably happy with the treatment. Feedback was generally positive, apart from some of those issues with the TMJ and, you know, you know, uh, jaw drop and what have you. So I realized, and those people uh, would have had uh, a big problem if they were not offered an effective, uh, good therapy that is acceptable to them. Uh, like uh, uh, oral appliances, because some of them uh, did not want to do CPAP, some of them were CPAP intolerant, some of them uh, for their lifestyle wanted uh, an oral device along with a CPAP to be able to use it on vacation, uh, weekends, holidays, or what have you. So that it took me about a couple of years, and then from that point on, the awareness and the satisfaction uh, like gradually increase to what I would say an optimal level. That's so great. It takes, a bit of time. it takes a bit of time. That's also maybe important 
for you know the dental colleague that it will take a bit of time to work with a sleep specialist or a sleep center to feel this level of comfort and to be able to uh, provide uh, enough information for them to see the efficacy and the uh, uh, positive response in terms of oral devices and also patient compliance with it, which is very important as well, because in most cases for people who complete the uh, treatment, the compliance rate is usually pretty impressive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dr. Michael, when you were at Stanford, how much did you get in the way of education on oral appliance therapy? You know, it's a, it's a good question. So I was a I was a sleep fellow at Stanford, particularly. You know, my focus was on sleep apnea surgery, um, and I had a, I had some incredible mentors there. You know, pioneers in the field, and and you know, obviously have to give huge credit to them, um, and and all they they've taught me for sure. So I was fortunate because I, I really got a breadth of exposure to see very different practice styles um, from working with, you know, an oral maxillofacial surgeon who's an MD DDS to working with a number of, you know, board certified sleep specialists. Um, and, and so I would say you get some exposure, but it's it really stops at the level of the referral. Um, you know, once the referral is off, that's kind of the, the limits of your exposure and training, to my opinion, as a, as a sleep specialist. Uh, you often obviously see the patient in post uh, titration follow up in order to you know determine efficacy of therapy and what have you. But really, the that mysterious step in between is sort of a, a black box to some degree, unless you actually go and seek out that knowledge. And actually, you know, it brings up a nice point because I wanted to to talk to John and get your your thoughts and hear your ideas here while we have the opportunity about. You know, how do you, how are you determining, how are you approaching, you know, what type of appliance is best for which patient and, you know, where your preferences lie? I know it's a very, you know, uh, large concept to kind of go over in a short time, but in a brief, do you think there, that you can uh, give us some insight there? Well, it's interesting because, you know, when I first got involved in this, uh, the, uh, the idea was you, you got to know an appliance really well and the ins and outs of that particular appliance, and you made that appliance for everybody. Yes. And uh, then as uh, time went on, uh, the thinking evolved and you started to realize, wait a second, there's differences between these different appliances. Mm -hmm. Like, are they pulling the jaw forward? Are they pushing the jaw forward? Are they pushing the jaw forward obliquely or the, along the horizontal plane? Where is the stress on the teeth? Where are the connectors? And so this is going to have implications on the dentition in an individual. So now you start thinking in terms of... Um, you know, which appliance would be best for this particular patient, which design would be best for this particular patient based on the dentition they present with? Are they missing teeth where they're critical to be there for a particular design, for instance? And then, of course, you know, there's a, this patient has a, a, a huge supine apnea uh, uh, component. So maybe we should use an appliance that does not push obliquely and downward forward. We should use an appliance that encourages jaw closure. You know, they may need to wear elastics anyway, but they may not if that's enough. So then, you know, that's another characteristic. So there's a whole bunch of different things that you look at the way the patient presents and the level of apnea and the um, even the ease of them calibrating the appliance. You know, if they have limited, uh, you know, then you, you would pick certain appliances that are easier for the patient to calibrate or adjust if you're doing at home calibration. And that's mm -hmm. another decision. Are you going to be home calibrating or uh, in office, you know, calibrating the appliance. So all of these things and others come together to help select a particular appliance that's optimum for a particular patient. And we we had discussed, uh, John and I, we, we spoke the other day, and I think we were talking about, you know, as a shift, uh, as a result of COVID in particular, that you feel that you're going to be going more towards in-home calibration versus in office because of obviously the, the current concerns is that uh, is that something that you're still thinking about yeah and and that's going to be a work in progress because i certainly love the model i've been working with um but there's a few things that i'm thinking about going forward at least for the next while and i'll say that rather than using a full hst um, level 3 hst like the nox d3 i'm thinking of using something more simpler to oximetry you know, to, to do the at-home caliber. It's just easier to turn that around, disinfect it, and there's fewer components and stuff, um, and um, disposables. 
and mm -hmm. um, the uh, the other thing I was thinking also is perhaps using an appliance with an anterior midpoint excluding stop more often because mm -hmm. that sort of tends to minimize some of the things that can go sideways on adjustments as you're moving the jaw forward because as you move the jaw forward it doesn't move forward symmetrically so it's now you've got inequalities that you have to adjust otherwise you will end up with this you know uh, discomforts on one side or the other mm -hmm. so if you use an anterior midpoint excluding stop uh, routinely, it gets rid of a lot of that, you know, so, you know, there's, there's some considerations where we can try and simplify so that we can use an appliance that's less likely to cause an issue if the patient themselves is calibrating forward, you know, and, and so these are some of the changes that I'm thinking about putting in place, at least during this COVID time, and then hopefully I would like to get back to the way, you know, I, I would prefer to practice. But, you know, the idea is to go back with protocols that are safe for the patient, minimize patient visits and safe for my staff, and you know, all the way around going to benefit everyone. And at the end of the day, it's about the position you put the jaw in, right? So as long as the appliance you're choosing will, you know, allow you to put the position, the patient in the right position, it's going to work. So that's, that's not uh, on the table as a concern. You know, it's about, you know, do it in, the, in a, the most efficient way possible, minimizing some of these things like office visits and so forth. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys, uh, Dr. Awad and Dr. Awad, how, how do you define uh, treatment success with oral appliance therapy when you see patients in follow-up? Uh, as I did mention, uh, success rate is uh, uh, is uh, uh, good at maybe about 80% or so. The only issue with uh, uh, oral appliances are two issues, the TMJ issue and the issue of that jaw drop that dentists don't talk too much about sometimes, but I believe it's important to address with the patient off the bat to make them aware and to let them be able to give that feedback if this is happening to the dentist to try and maybe provide them with some particular advice or a different device or what have you. So that is usually uh, my, my uh, feedback and my experience and my impression of the oral uh, device. Yeah. I think, I think Lewis as well. Sorry, John, I'll, I'll jump in here to, to ask for that before you, you respond. I think, Lewis, it's also really important to think about how do we determine what is success? Sure. Um, just like in the surgical literature, again, I'm going to keep referring back to, to surgery here and there because that's, you know, that's obviously my, my keen area of interest. But just like in the surgical literature, we define, you know, what is surgical success? What is surgical cure? And I think that's something that we haven't necessarily established as well uh, in the in the sleep medicine literature for oral appliances. And so, you know, we have to think about what do we consider to be a success? So if I refer a patient, you know, to see John and they were CPAP intolerant, they had a starting AHI of say 75, and that's maybe not the, the most typical candidate for an oral appliance, but they were having, you know, an oxygen desaturation index up to 65, and, you know, they're spending most of their night in moderate to severe persistent hypoxemia. And they come back and we do their final post-titration study. Now their AHI is 21, uh, but you know their, their minimum O2 SAT is say 89 now versus the previous. To me, that's a success. It may not, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the family physician who then gets that paper back and reads it and they read, you know, oh, well, the AHI is 17, this is or 23, this is moderate sleep apnea still, they might not consider it a success. But in my books, that's a success. And when we look at the literature, looking at cardiovascular uh, morbidity and mortality uh, as it relates to sleep apnea, I think we really need to keep those figures and those, you know, those established guidelines in mind uh, when we de determine and define success. So I think it's really a key about setting the expectation for the patient as well. You know, you, you've reduced the AHI by more than half. Uh, you know, they don't have those severe persistent oxygen deprivation or oxygen desaturation, and maybe. Let's not fixate on the number of, you know, uh, of events necessarily, but let's focus on long-term uh, cardiovascular risk. Uh, and, you know, also how does the patient feel? Right. Oh, that, that is, a, is a, very good, a very good point. And that is an evolving kind of uh, way of thinking, even for me, because maybe in the past, especially in some of those severe uh, CPAP intolerant patients, 
we wanted what we call optimal results, you know, uh, AHI under 10 or preferably even five, you know, perfect oxygen and all of that. But I totally agree that if we are able to minimize the severity to a level that will not pose significant cardiovascular or cerebrovascular issues, we have done a great job for the patient. But in my opinion, and also in terms of client's opinion, what is important also are two things. Lots of the people who come for testing or seek help have two major issues. Poor quality sleep, non-restorative sleep, they never wake up feeling rested, and the snoring, which is a serious issue, not necessarily even for the client, but for the partner. And there is a very good evidence that five years of disruptive snoring will kill most marriages without <laughs> interruption. Yeah, I, I mean, well, snoring, we, we know from the literature, snoring is actually the, the loud disruptive snoring to the bed partner is actually the, not, the number one reason for presentation to, uh, to a sleep specialist. Uh, exactly. Above, above then, all yeah, and by then also, believe it or not, uh, a large number of those bed partners will develop a, a non-respiratory um, sleep problem that become difficult to treat. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to address those two symptoms, so the patient is reporting his feeling, he's sleeping better, more rested, and waking up feeling as if he has had a decent sleep, and the snoring is no longer an issue in terms of the bed partner having to leave the room or sleep on the couch or what have you, that, in my opinion, will also present a very good level of success. You good with those parameters, Dr. V? Can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say, Michael, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you and I'm so happy that you've uh, decided to make at least in part your home in Ontario, um, you know, as you know, after finishing at Stanford. Everything you said is so refreshing and that's ex exactly the proper way to, uh, I think, my opinion, to, to, to look at oral appliances, um, um, you know, keeping in mind that the, how they've reduced cardiovascular risk, improved the situation, you know, the level of improvement rather than that they get the patient down below five. And unfortunately, this is 2020 and there's still way too many steep decisions looking at that uh, criteria as a reason to dismiss the oral appliance because the oral appliance doesn't always get the patient down to below five. You know, the truth is we know that about a third of the time we still have some meaningful residual apnea when you make an appliance. So, you know, with an appliance, it's either the whole journey for say 66 or 60% of the patients, and then for the other 35 or whatever percent of the patients is gonna be the beginning of the journey where we look at adjunctive therapies including position, as Dr. Oad mentioned about, you know, the jaw dropping or adding elastics to the appliance or, um, you know, uh, reducing, working working on reducing the weight or changing up some other lifestyle things or perhaps even some surgical revision of, of, of the airway by someone like yourself to, to help get the patient the rest of the way. So, you know, the, the appliance isn't the magic bullet. But when the patient is, um, you know, prescribed CPAP and they absolutely walk away, either before trying it or after trying it. If that patient is lost, then we've done harm because we've not allowed that individual the opportunity to try an alternative therapy that has actually a very reasonable success rate. And, and uh, especially with regards to symptom relief because of the mean disease alleviation concept, we know that even though it doesn't, because of the usage through the night, even though it doesn't get the apnea all the way down, it seems to relieve symptoms to a very similar degree to, to, uh, to CPAP. And that's established in the literature by Van Der Veek and others. And so, you know, it, for, let somebody walk away rather than try an alternative therapy that has all this behind it is doing harm. And too many, not you folks, but too many physicians uh, allow that to happen because the patient is just not cooperating with their treatment of choice, which is their, their first recommendation, you know? And yeah. I'm just gonna, gonna say that this is, this is an ongoing problem and we need to get woke about this. Everybody in the industry that put the patient first and make sure they get the treatment they need, whichever treatment it is that's gonna be optimum for them.
no, that is, that is a very good point, uh, really, John. And in our practice, and I, I, you know, I wish other, you know, sleep specialists would do the same. We uh, focus as much on CPAP failures or uh, CPAP intolerance or people who are not happy with the treatment as much as success stories and people who did very well and feeling amazing or what have you. And we try our very best to offer those people follow up, further assessment and further uh, education. And big part of that education involve oral devices. Um, obviously, uh, for the majority of them, if they are a reasonable candidate. So I totally agree with you on this. Yeah. John, you also touched on a really nice point there, which is uh, collaborative therapies. Uh, because I think, you know, as you say, those who are, are really uh, understanding of where the field is headed today are understanding that we're moving away from this treatment paradigm of the Hail Mary pass. That's, you know, the one that for, I, I know, Lewis, you're a Cowboys fan, so, you know, that's that one pass to get to the, yeah, I know, I know, right? That's that one pass to get to the end zone and score the touchdown to get to that final, you know, treatment, uh, treatment goal. But I think what we're seeing now more often is really a combination of therapies. So, for example, even in, you know, in my field uh, or in my area of interest, you know, the, the latest and greatest nowadays is what we call upper airway stimulation or an implantable pacemaker like device for, for breathing. For those who are familiar, uh, you know, and even that surgical treatment, which has all of this great evidence behind it and what have you. We often find a subset of patients who still have supine dependent sleep apnea despite the use of the implant. Um, and so, you know, it's very similar. It's a similar treatment paradigm, just like with an oral appliance. You know, you need to interpret the results that you get back with your post titration study and say, okay, maybe the AHI is still slightly elevated versus, you know, what, what you were hoping for. But is there an element of positional therapy that we can then add on top of this? Can we add, can we do positional therapy plus an oral appliance to really now with two steps? So instead of throwing that one Hail Mary pass, hoping to score, you know, the touchdown, you have a couple of downs to get there and you can finally kind of, you know, get the patient where they need to go. Uh, but you do it in a couple of steps. And I think that's really where we're seeing treatment paradigm shifting towards. It's really not just about one therapy, but really about taking into account number one patient preference, but all of the available uh, supply and you know varying spectrum of treatments that are available to us to offer. Do you guys have a set protocol in your office whereby you're making outreach or connecting with patients that that are CPAP non-compliant? Are you are you are you being aggressive in and trying to get those patients in? in order to uh, uh, offer alternative therapies? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And we have a very strict procedure regarding those patients. Patients are contacted right away once we get a report back from their you know, uh, home trial on CPAP, if it was prescribed. Uh, once this information is received, uh, uh, the patients are contacted and offered a follow-up appointment. Uh, you have had issues, you have had difficulties, there are other options which will most probably were mentioned even at the initial consultation. It will be very helpful to come back, sit with the doctor, he can go over what else can be done to address your issues and what have you. Uh, maybe 50% give or take will book an appointment and the rest will decline. Mm -hmm. We follow up with a letter to the family physician uh, explaining to them the result again, uh, the potential health risks, and encouraging him to uh, engage with the patient to allow them or to uh, get them to come back and do this follow-up uh, uh, appointment, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, with that uh, communication or the letter to the family physician, most probably we get back another 30 percent. So that is really our approach. And if the patient is, is very severe, we definitely uh, make the family physician very aware, not only of the serious uh, health issues, but also the potential safety, especially, you know, with, you know, driving or people are in key position, operating heavy machinery and so on and so forth. And that's often where, where you know, we have, we, we have uh, an interesting practice uh, where we have really a multidisciplinary team. We have, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Howard Awad is a, is a psychiatrist by background. We also have, you know, 
pulmonologist or respirologist. I'm an, uh, an ENT surgeon by background. So often, you know, we have the capability to, to share within our practice in that sense. And uh, often that's where I'll get involved. So those CPAP intolerant patients, they'll, they they may, may then get inter-referred uh, to see me to discuss potential other options. And uh, uh, John, I think we can we can fairly say we, you know we're looking at really creating this um, uh, really dedicated CPAP intolerant uh, clinic, so to speak. So really a subset of our clinic where we'll work with uh, you know John uh, in concert in direct concert, really one to one uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion for those patients who are CPAP intolerant. I think that's that's a first offering of its kind in Ontario, to be honest with you. Excited to be part of that. Yeah, absolutely, John. We're, we're thrilled. At the risk of sounding like Joe Sales guy, I, I want to ask a question. Um, do you guys see value in the happy CPAP user also having an oral device as backup um, for, you know, for travel purposes and what have you? If there's a power outage, this comes up a lot in my line of work when we're out there talking to our dental customers and and, and even end users. Uh, what are your thoughts there? I, I'm, I'm happy to do it uh, uh, all the time. If the patient asks for it, or if there is um, uh, information from the history and the presentation to suggest that would be beneficial, uh, I, I do it and I have done it several times you know, over the years, yeah. Yeah. Same thing here. I mentioned this. I mentioned this in the webinar the other day. We we had some tornadoes rip through Dallas last year, and and it knocked out power for three full days in one of the most beautiful, exclusive areas of the city with multi-million dollar homes. No power for three days, and you just can't help but wonder what are those poor people doing at night? You know. So, uh, yeah, it's something to think about for sure. Yeah, exactly. So I exactly. have patients. I'm uh, sorry. I have patients uh, come when they're planning an extended trip to uh, India, um, for instance, where there's regions where the power is in and out all the time, and they're specifically not that they have a problem with CPAP, but they're specifically looking for a solution to be able to take care of their sleep when that happens. So they plan on bringing their CPAP with them, but they also want an appliance because they know they're going to be going into that environment. And of course, there's the people that go camping and, you know, other, yeah. other uh, you know, situations like that. Yeah, camping is a big one here. Lots mm -hmm. of people go camping and they want to be like they are out in the woods for two to three weeks. And definitely, an, you know, an oral device would be very convenient uh, and uh, obviously very safe to use without any uh, issues. So I totally agree with that. And I do it. I, I, I do it like, uh, you know, very freely. And I recommend it if the patient asks me, of course, it will work. It will be effective. It will, you know, bridge the time you are not able to use CPAP and uh, it should be overall good. And also with those people, there are even minimal implication in terms of any pressure on the jaw or you know pmg or anything like that so that's almost like a perfect you know scenario so can i say something please uh, so so dr watts brought up pmj about three times and i just wanted to i just want to make a statement about tmj or a tmj is a temporomandibular joint but temporomandibular dysfunction if you will right uh, and that is that in over 30 years of literature there's really nothing documenting that uh, uh, these oral appliances create temporomandibular dysfunction or lead to problems in a very small percentage of people you're going to get a change in symptoms like you know clicking when there was no clicking or the clicking might even disappear if there was clicking or other things like that. But, you know, uh, it's very, very, very infrequent that a patient stops wearing an appliance because of a temporomandibular joint uh, problem. I, I mean, I, I've placed thousands of these appliances. It is just not something that happens. Now, we have a surgeon on the panel here. Uh, I, 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 I from just recently graduated, access to the most recent information uh, you know, that's being taught in, in this area. So do you know of anything that uh, uh, is concerning with regards to oral appliance therapy and, and temporomandibular dysfunction? So, I, I mean, know. obviously, that, that's, that's one. That I see it clinically, uh, uh, John. Right. And that's, yeah. So I'm going to and point something out. Yeah, yeah. and in fact, maybe, but they have had not had it before. And believe it or not, I had also seen it with a number of dentists, in fact, who came to get you know non-oral device 
treatment because of that issue. So I'm, I'm again. I, I, I get what you're saying, absolutely, and you're going to see it. I'm going to explain it. Yeah. And the thing is, but I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, uh, Michael to answer the question. But let me just explain what you just said. In my opinion here, when we see this type of stuff, it's most likely the individual that placed that appliance did not manage it properly. And so the person has had issues with their joint because they have a, a, an appliance that's just not fitting properly. They're not following the rules of engagement. And, and yeah. as a result, what happens is you get a clinician on the other end hearing that, oh, uh, my PMJ is bothering me, I can't wear the appliance. And so unfortunately, we have a problem with poorly trained dentists out there dabbling in, in, in the field, which is a separate conversation altogether. And, and so, but we can't confuse that with what we see in the literature about, you know, like uh, evidence, any evidence of real TMJ issues as a result of oral appliances. So Michael, please, if I, if you could respond on that. Yeah, yeah, John, it's a, it's an interesting point that you bring up and, um, you know, we mentioned earlier, but John in particular is very involved in, in educating, uh, you know, the dental community on appropriately fitting oral appliances. And like anything, this is a, you know, this is a very sub-specialty niche area of, uh, of practice, like all of, you know, sleep in, in particular in a sense, right? And so the further you get down the line as far as learning those treatments, the more expertise you really need to do it well. Um, and so, you know, really not to not to toot your horn here, John, or anything like that. I've never seen one of your patients coming back with TMJ dysfunction. Um, I have seen other patients from, you know, from uh, dentists who do this infrequently and perhaps, you know, don't follow the patient as closely. And I, I do ask those patients, I say, you know, well, have you seen your dentist? They said, no, as soon as I got the appliance, you know, I, I didn't I didn't see them again in that case. And so... I, I think it, it begs to follow that, you know, it's really about following that patient clinically. And, you know, I don't know if, John, if you regularly use, for example, a, you know, you fashion a splint for the patient to use in the morning to, you know, restore their, uh, their bite and what have you. But often the case uh, is that I've seen that, uh, you know, these dentists who are fitting these infrequently may not take those types of precautions that are necessary to keep uh, to keep the you know the joint in good functioning position uh, after the regular use of the device it's interesting that you mentioned the am aligners or realigners yeah. or whatever you want to call them but sometimes over effort over effort trying mm -hmm. too hard to reclaim that bite in the morning actually leads to you know uh, dysfunction and, and pain in the jaw joint so yeah. even not adequately counseling your patient as to what to do and how to reestablish your bite in the morning can lead to these problems. Not just the appliance not fitting properly, not being balanced properly, right? And you know, if you pick an appliance, I'll tell you what to watch for on the balance part because it depends on the design of the appliance. But then mm -hmm. there's also just an activity. People can be in an effort to try and reestablish their bite anymore in, in the morning because the the dentist told them you have to reestablish your bite and this is how you do it. And they try so hard that they're straining their joint every day. And now, well, their appliance is hurting their joint because now the joint hurts all day long. Well, yeah. it's really not that. They're just doing that to themselves in the morning by following a, a poor protocol. So this is where it's important to be working with a dentist that's well-trained, that has taken the time to learn how to do it. It's not rocket science, but mm -hmm. you have to take the time to learn how to do it. And like, and like anything, it's about follow-up, right? Uh, you know, Absolutely, yeah. If you don't yeah. follow up with your patients, you're really never going to know when they develop problems. And so that's why we're, we're fortunate to have this working relationship with someone like John, where, you know, we, we know that the patient's followed up and they're followed up at regular intervals. There's a protocol that's followed. Uh, and, you know, that's why we, we rarely see those issues with, uh, with his patients. I want to encourage the audience to type out any questions you have in the chat box if you'd like. I do see that we've got a couple of questions, and before we get to those, let me ask you guys: How does COVID-19 change the, the the future as far as uh, you know, change the world of of sleep medicine? What are your what are your thoughts on on uh, what the future looks like with this virus and all the craziness that has ensued? A tough one to answer, really, because the impact, you know, uh, has been devastating so far, and we are definitely hoping for better. But uh, with with you know all the precautions and 
all the guidelines or what have you are trying to very gradually and very slowly re-establish a practice but the future looks if anything very questionable at this point in time I, yeah i think you could probably spend an entire panel um you know day discussion talking about the impact uh, i think there's there's some some interesting things to take i think it's going to uh, significantly increase the uptake of you know video consultation telemedicine services i'm sure a lot of our audience are experiencing that already you know uh, providers who are otherwise uncomfortable doing so have been forced into a position where they have to learn to adapt to it um, and there's some interesting things to take from that it is it is uh, refreshing and somewhat interesting to see the patient in their home environment when you're doing a, a video consult a telemedicine consult you can actually glean a lot about the home sleep environment just from you know hearing the kids running around the, the house and then seeing the patient in their bedroom and all that kind of thing which you're you're now seeing live uh, every day uh, when you're doing these consults. So it's, there, there are things to take from that. But I also think it, it really is adding uh, a new line of questioning for us as sleep specialists. Uh, because, for example, you know, even when you are prescribing uh, PAP therapy, you really do need to take into consideration now who else is in the household. What are the potential exposure risks for those other individuals who are using PAP therapy? Uh, and you know we can get into into a really long you know discussion about this, but just to to really summarize from my perspective, you know what we're seeing now is that we have to really think about are there el elderly or vulnerable populations in the household that maybe there is some associated risk of you know sharing a bedroom with uh, with somebody who has a, a, you know a CPAP unit, um, and so counseling those patients that if they have concerns about you know. Uh, potentially having developed or developing symptoms of COVID that they should follow up with us so that we can discuss next steps, whether it be, you know, isolating themselves into another bedroom when they're using the PAP. And again, for anybody who's not familiar with this, that the concern or potential concern, although it's not strictly proven in the literature as yet, is that of the aerosol generating component of CPAP and the, the associated leak that we know happens with the use of positive airway pressure. And so you have to have that conversation with the patients now when you're initiating therapy. Uh, and, you know, if there are significant risks, you know, say they live with an elderly, uh, you know, an elderly parent who has a lot of comorbidities um, that put them at risk for serious COVID related disease. And they're still, you know, perhaps an essential worker. They have to go out every day and come back home and, and you know, then use their path. Maybe you have to have a conversation with them about alternative treatments in that scenario to give them the option. Maybe an oral appliance is best in that scenario. Um, but you know, these are all things that we're that we're learning uh, that are evolving over the course of, of this pandemic, uh, and it's definitely going to shape and impact the way that we we carry out our practice. Yeah, yeah, it definitely had an impact on uh, our advice to uh, people who are uh, in a long-term care or nursing homes. In right. terms of uh, in terms of utilization of CPAP and and in this very vulnerable population and what to do or what have you, uh, which has been very challenging because some of those people need the therapy badly, but also there are risks, multiple risks to everybody around. And, and I want to be clear here because it's a very controversial topic that there aren't right or wrong answers on this yet. We don't have the data yet. Uh, and that's a key area for us moving forward to establish that data. Yeah. So we, we, there's more we don't know than than there is that we know. Is, is what was said earlier. And and you know, yes, uh, uh, leaks are uh, just the, the way it is with with CPAP masks. Yeah, even the best fitting CPAP mask will leak to some degree. But what we don't really know is how relevant that leak is. And, exactly. and so we can make things up about it, we can make a big deal about it, but we just, you know, we really don't know. Just like the aerosol issue with dental practices and all these concerns and precautions that are being taken, we really don't know. There's not good science to demonstrate exactly what the implications of those aerosols are. Um, but uh, I keep seeing new information coming out on this every day. And so, you know, people are making decisions today, running off doing certain things based on what they think we know. And then in two weeks or three weeks or two months, we'll find out that they did it for not. And so we have to be careful not to read too much into this latest statement that the ADSM put out, that oral appliances should be first line therapy in the COVID environment. That's the ADSM position. It's not the ADSM position. And um, it's something that we need to apply this information thoughtfully to our patient. I think the way uh, Michael uh, presented it is 
very thoughtful with regards to taking into consideration, uh, you know, the patient's situation and what would best, um, you, know, uh, you know, all the pros and cons. And I, I think that's what needs to be done rather than think this is, uh, this is the answer, just give everybody an appliance. You know, I, I don't think that that's an appropriate way to be uh, dealing with this. Education or educating the patient and giving, making, making them aware and giving yeah. them the option. Absolutely. And yes, I agree. Yeah. Management kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I'm going to read through a couple of questions. Uh, it was, uh, it's always been our intent that these webinars would go about 40 or 45 minutes. We're at 51 minutes. So uh, it's just been awesome. You guys are, are, are awesome. Um, uh, let me read a couple of questions. Um, what is jaw drop? Did I hear that properly? Yes. Yeah. Some we'll people. Let, we'll let John take that take that one away here. Yeah. So uh, I, I let me uh, please confirm that I'm interpreting it correctly, Doctor Watt. Um, I, I believe that means when when the patient's wearing an appliance and their jaws dropping open during sleep when they're in supine position, if that isn't managed, now that would never yeah. happen in one of my patients because I check for that with an HST when I'm you know, calibrating the appliance and, and I correct it with elastics or perhaps even right up front use an appliance that doesn't allow jaw drop. Like, a, like I'm not gonna mention any names. And so that it, it um, you know, it, the, once again, this has to do with the, the dentist doing their work properly before they get back to the sleep specialist, right? But that's what I believe, and is it correct? Yes, that that's what you were talking about. Minute, and you know, that was in fact, believe it or not, I would not, I mean, uh, to be honest and upfront, I was not aware of it up until a number of years ago, and it brought to my attention by a dentist who came to see me as a client. Right. Another you know, I, I'm going to say something that you'll find interesting. Uh, this morning, I did a webinar for an organization here in, in, in Toronto that does a lot of CE at, uh, at, at, uh, at 10 this morning. And there was, I don't know, but 110 dentists on there. And I, I took a poll at the beginning of the webinar before I started speaking, asked them, you know, have you made you know, zero appliances, uh, zero to five appliances, you know, like five to, uh, you know, 15 appliances or 15 and above or whatever. And there was... 3%, 70% of the audience had never made one appliance. And, wow. and only 3% of the uh, audience had made more than 20 appliances. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking 97% either yes. had never made an appliance or had made the odd appliance, right? No, so that's the level of experience out there in, yeah. in the dental field. So when a dentist comes to you themselves, don't assume because they're a dentist, you think that they're going to be knowledgeable about what even the jaw drop is? They're, 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 I, I deal with it all the time when the dentist calls me and they've made an appliance for themselves and it's not, you know, working and they don't know what to do and this and, and so you know, they haven't taken a course, they haven't bothered to learn. But that just the dentist moniker alone does not mean that they are qualified to do anything or do anything with our appliances. Absolutely, John. I 100% agree, and I make that dis distinction very clearly. To yeah. all my clients, when we are talking an oral device, I say to them, this is highly specialized field. Your success rate depends on how good and how knowledgeable the dentist who is going to do it. I always make it very clear. Yeah. And if they ask for recommendation, we recommend you. But that is very good point and a very important point. Yeah. Well, we frequently get the question, you know, when 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 I, I frequently get the question in our practice where uh, we start discussing oral appliance therapy and they say, okay, I'll, I'll go see my dentist about that. I say, well, hang on, let's talk about maybe what, what the options might be as far as, you know, next step and who and how you should go about this. Sure, sure. And, and I, I, some of them insist, but, you know, I tell them the following. Please ask your dentist how many oral devices they have done. If they have done under 20, at least think about it. Maybe Here's another question. Here's another question. It's not really a question. It's more of a comment. But uh, I, I think I think that this person is just maybe asking for suggestions. Uh, I am having a hard time getting a happy, successful patient to return to the sleep physician for an efficacy study, despite being aware of the importance at the outset. So how do you, uh, Doctor Viviana, how do you make that? 
that that's a, a that's a real tough one and i know that the physicians often you know hold it against the dentist when the patient doesn't want to return and i, I can tell you that i go out of my way to make sure they understand that the hst i use is to calibrate the appliance it's not the same as the in-lab sleep study they're going to be getting to finally determine how effective it is I don't have that technology available because I go out of my way to reinforce the importance of going back. And even then, you know, we, we know there's going to be a certain percentage of patients that will not go back because they, they've got a solution now. They're feeling good. Not only will they not go back for the sleep study, but they won't even come back to me for follow-up. And I'm obligated to see them again in six months and then yearly after that, write a report to the referring physician whether they come or not. You know, I, I, I have to, because it's an accredited facility, I have to be following all those milestone reporting. So it is really challenging. You can use your best verbal skills and that's all you can do. At the end of the day, you know that not all patients are gonna comply with that. Uh, I don't have a better answer other than the fact that you need to make sure they understand the importance of it and make sure they understand that whatever testing that you're doing as a dentist does not replace the final efficacy study to determine whether this is ruining the job properly or not, you know, yeah. and, and 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 it's important that you get that that across to them. And I think when the patient is presented with the equation that this is, you know, the dentist, the sleep dentist, and the sleep specialist are a fundamentally integrated, multidisciplinary team, that's when you'll you'll really get that positive result. It's difficult to establish, though, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Another question here is kind of aimed at me, actually, and it and it, it he asks. Um, I heard that you had mentioned an interesting new program that Somnomed has come up with, where that will assist me in in my physician outreach efforts. What uh, what this uh, dentist is asking about is our new um, effectiveness equation. This is a new. Um, it's a very high quality uh, professional tool uh, to use with physicians to explain the clinical proof behind oral appliance therapy relative to CPAP. And uh, it's something that our team will be armed with on their iPads or their laptops to go in and, and either uh, meet with physicians that, uh, you know, that Dr. V, that you're, 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 you're trying to get in front of them and help them kind of understand the value uh, of what you offer in your practice. Um, or our team will go with you too uh, in order to make those calls. So it is, uh, it's, it's brand new. My sales team is only training on the effectiveness equation currently uh, now, um, but they will be, uh, Dr. Viviano, has, has Eric Cosgrove by chance mentioned this to you yet? He's mentioned it, but I have not seen it. Okay, okay, yeah, good. Yeah. You will, you will soon. Um, Eric is, is, a, is in the middle of training with us. So anyway, yeah, for those we, of you that are listening yeah, in, yeah, we've heard What's a little up? bit. Of the, we've heard a little bit of the outreach uh, uh, on, you know, on the, in the west side of, uh, of Ontario. We've we've had, uh, I believe, Eric actually had uh, had reached out as well. So I know that's something that's happening. Yeah. So for those in the audience, just understand that that's that's a tool that uh, obviously will be made available. Um, last last question that I'll ask, and then we'll call it a day. Does risk of of aerosol with PAP mean oral appliances could be safer for mild to moderate cases. We kind of already covered that, right? In the, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we're. I think we're all. We're all in agreement that at this point, you know, you have to have the conversation with, uh, you know, with your patients, and you have to present them with, uh, with a real world view of what the potential risks are, what are the limitations of our current knowledge, uh, and you have to be willing to consider, you know. To be quite honest with you, I, I really, I, I'm going to maybe uh, ride up a few feathers here, but I, I, in a lot of cases, I don't necessarily consider one to be first line or second line. It really comes down to the patient preference, because at the end of the day, you can say that PAP is, you know, gold standard and first line as much as you want, but if that's not what the patient wants, it's not their first line. Um, so I think really, you know, if you have that dynamic, then, then it doesn't change a whole lot. You're really presenting the options to the patient. Uh, in an unbiased and, and objective way based on uh, best evidence and data. And it's, uh, and it's a patient decision as to what to do next, especially in those mild to moderate cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, I, I can't thank you enough for this. Um, your, your attendance matters today. Um, our audience, I'm sure, uh, uh, have a lot of 
uh, pearls to take back to their practices. Can't thank you enough. Um, Want to wish all of you guys a, a, a terrific weekend. For those of us in the U.S., Monday's a holiday, Memorial Day. Everybody enjoy the three-day weekend. And um, um, thank you, gentlemen, once again, very, very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Dr. Zawad. Hey, John, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more thing for all of those that are still on. So next uh, next week we have two more. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ken Mogel in Florida and his big time referring doc, uh, Dr. Chediak will be on with us uh, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central Time, uh, followed by Dr. Uh, Brandon Hedgecock and his full time uh, sales and marketing field marketing rep, Sarah, will be joining us on Friday. So two more next week. Uh, that you don't want to miss. Be following our social media threads, both Facebook and LinkedIn, where all upcoming webinars are featured. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a fabulous weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care of yourself.